invite you to open up your Bibles today to the book of Acts. We're in a series entitled The Bird, the Blaze, and the Breeze, the Person of the Holy Spirit. And we want to continue on that this morning uh, and talk about the breeze, how uh, the Holy Spirit is likened unto a rushing, mighty wind. Um, anytime someone uses symbolism, it's a way to teach you something that you might not know that much about. Um, and so with the Holy Spirit, we see a lot of symbolism because we know that Jesus knew and uh, the Father knew that many people would have an idea of what and who he is, uh, but would not be sure. And so symbolism helps us identify um, who he's like. And so he's like a bird, a dove, and not just like an eagle or a raven, but a dove. And he's likened unto a dove for a reason. Um, he's likened unto a blaze. Uh, when he came, cloven tongues of fire appeared over the head of each person who was filled with him on the day of Pentecost. So he's like fire. If you can understand fire, you can understand some of the personality of the Holy Spirit. And then he's also like a wind. He is like a breeze. Uh, this series is designed to get each and every one of us filled with God's Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. And for those of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit to maintain a spirit-filled life. A passage of scripture that kept coming up to my heart all weekend is in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, a man comes to Jesus. He's a Pharisee, which just simply means very smart religious person. Uh, and he comes up to Jesus and he says, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you've studied things, what do you say? And he said, well, you should love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, you have said correctly. And the, the guy trying to be like a wise guy and a little sarcastic, he says, well, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus proceeds to tell the story that we call the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know the story goes like this. There was a guy on a journey. He was encountered by robbers. Robbers beat him up, took his stuff, left him on the side of the road half dead. And in the story, we see some very religious people. It'd be the equivalent of the pastor and the worship pastor. Uh, so uh, you, you see uh, these two spiritual people are people who are supposed to be spiritual, they're on a journey, and instead of having their journey be interrupted, they just continue on their journey, and they pass around the person who was left half dead. But there's another person in the story, and it's called the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan uh, is on a journey as well, but he sees this man left half dead, and instead of continuing on his journey, he stops. And he is willing to see. And it's amazing how oftentimes we look but don't see. We look at all the people, but we don't see anybody. Uh, we look at all the people in Kroger or Walmart or whatever it is, but we're, we're on purpose not trying to see anybody. <laughs> you know, so all those types of things. So he's, he's willing to see his need. And when he sees the need, he has compassion for it. And he not only has compassion for it, but he is blessed uh, with two types of strength. He has physical strength. And he has a type and shadow of spiritual strength. Uh, so he picks the man up, and when he, he picks him up, uh, he pours in oil and wine. The wine would cleanse the wound. The oil would begin to heal it. And then he picks him up on the, you know, his donkey, and he brings him over to the inn. And at the inn, he takes care of him there. But he knows, I have to continue my journey as well, because God knows you have to continue yours as well. So he tells the innkeeper, which is a type and shadow of a pastor, uh, he says, I will take care of you and the inn, which is a type and shadow of the local church. Um, and uh, I will come back, and if you need anything, and he needs anything, I will fund you financially uh, to be able to provide care for him. Now, I, I was meditating on this, and I remembered a, a story. In fact, I was having a conversation with someone when they shared this story. I remember the minister saying this. They said if the, the Good Samaritan had no money, he wouldn't have been the Good Samaritan. He would have only had good intentions. <laughs> and so out of that, does God want us to have physical strength? You bet. Uh, in the book of John, uh, the, the, uh, third John, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Uh, God wants you to have good health, 
and God wants you to prosper. And the reason why is not just so you can be blessed, but so that you who are strong can bear the burdens of the weak. Uh, that we are so blessed by God that we are enabled to be a blessing, that we have uh, the, the ability physically to do good things for the kingdom of God. But what's interesting about this is this individual did not just have physical strength to pick him up and put him on the donkey. Uh, he didn't just have financial strength to be able to pay for his bills or whatever he racked up at the end. He also had a type and shadow of spiritual strength. And the oil and the wine is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, um, that it begins to cleanse and then it begins to heal. And he was a possessor of those things. And then Jesus, when he's done telling the story, he says, now who was the neighbor in the story? And the, the Pharisee said, well, I guess it was the Good Samaritan. He said, exactly, go thou, you, and do likewise. Now, here's the point. When we think of like having spiritual strength, of being carriers of, you know, spiritual things, a lot of times we would point to the exact people Jesus said we would point to. Well, that's for the pastor or that's for the worship pastor. Like we want our worship pastors to have spiritual strength. I'm thankful for worship pastors that have spiritual strength. It's one thing to be talented. It's another thing to be anointed. Uh, and I'm thankful for both. Uh, and so that, that we have uh, just so many musicians and singers who are talented but also wait on the Lord. Uh, and so in our minds, it's like, yes, like our worship pastors and our, our singers and musicians, they should be filled with spiritual strength. Our, we look at our pastors, our, our men and women of God, and it's like, they should be filled with spiritual strength. But the reason why Jesus picked the story and wrote it the way he wrote it and spoke it the way he spoke it is because the Samaritan was considered like the worst of society. Uh, it was somebody who was considered like on the, the lowest rung of the totem pole in that, that day and age. And the reason why Jesus is using him as someone who would be a carrier of physical strength and spiritual strength was so that you would see you. That I am to be the possessor of a, a spiritual strength. That I, I am to walk around on my person with the oil and the wine of God's spirit. Uh, that I'm a carrier of it. Uh, that I have been healed by it. But not only have I have been healed by the, the oil and wine of God's spirit, but I know how to give it to others, and I am willing to interrupt my journey to do so anytime the occasion demands of me. A carrier of the spirit of God. Now, what I, I want this series to do, and honestly what, what I want to do for you, is to just call you up higher. Uh, I have a, a guy that I, I work out with a good bit, and I, I, I'm working out with my kids now, which is interesting, uh, because whenever we work out with him, he raises us all a level. Uh, he's a, a Marine, and so out of that, he has learned a certain discipline in the gym, and so like, I took my daughter this, weekend, this week, and it was the first time she worked out with him. And, like, it's always, I know you have two more in you. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, I really don't think she does. I, and like, <laughs> it's kind of like, I, I think she needs, like, support uh, and that kind of thing. But sure enough, she was able to do it. Uh, and she talked about how much she enjoyed it. But then the next day, because it was legs, uh, she talked about, like, I, I can't stand. Like, it hurts to stand. I'm like, I know, it'll get better. Uh, but anyway, my point is, is that whenever you're around him in, in this arena, he calls you up higher. And that you're not just in the gym and with other people in the gym, but there's somebody in the gym who's calling out a higher version of you. Now, I know church is church, and I'm thankful for church. Like, and, and cute church is great, nice facilities are great, and all these types of other things. But how many of you think we ought to be in a place where all of us are so progressing spiritually that when you come into our church, there is something about us that is calling you up higher? That I'm not just going to be around the things of God. I want to be filled with the things of God. I want to be a carrier of oil and wine. And so I'm going to ask you a question to challenge you. I don't want you to fall under condemnation uh, if you're here. Uh, God's not a God of condemning. 
Uh, but he is a God that has deep that calls into deep. And so I want to pose a question to challenge you. Is when is the last time, honestly, honestly, when is the last time your journey was interrupted and you poured in oil and wine into somebody else's life? In your own life, when you are wounded and when you are hurting, what do you turn to? Uh, for healing, for comfort, for cleansing, and for healing. Do you turn to the oil and wine? Do you even know it's available to you? And do you have it on your person so that when you are wounded and hurt, you've got something on you that you know you can pour into that situation as well? When is the last time your children were going through something and instead of just dealing with it in the natural, you poured out oil and wine? Your, your career was going through something, and instead of just dealing it with the natural, you poured out oil and wine. You made room for the Spirit of God to come and do what only He could do in that situation. Uh, and what I just want to inspire you to do is to live a life so filled with God's Spirit uh, that when you encounter need in your life or in someone else's, you know that such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, we're about to see God do some things that only God can do because I know what I am a carrier of. Uh, the Holy Spirit is like a wind. He is like a breeze. We see this here in Acts chapter 2. Uh, they'll put it up on the screens. In verse number 1, it says, On the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, distributed themselves, and they rested upon each one of them, and they were all, every one of them, filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now notice when the Holy Spirit came, he came like a rushing, mighty wind. Um, now with wind, you can't see it. It's an invisible force. So once again, symbolism of you can't see the Spirit of God, just like wind, you can't see wind. But with wind, you can do two things. With uh, Number one, you can see the effects of the wind. Um, and if you slow down and become aware of it, you can sense the direction of it. The other day, I was just out in my, my yard um, just looking at things. <laughs> I don't know if any of you do that. It's like, where's the water flowing? You know, it's called adulting. Uh, but, but anyway, like I'm, I'm looking at property and looking how to take care of it. Uh, and, you know, as I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, I, I look up and I, I become aware of the wind. And I look in the trees and I, I can't see it, but I can see the effects of it. It's moving the leaves, that there's a movement in the tree that wasn't there without the wind, but when the wind came, I couldn't see the wind, but I could see the effects of it. And the more I stood there and, and kind of stilled my heart and stilled myself and became aware of the wind, I could feel it, I could sense it. Couldn't see it, but I could sense it. And I noticed the direction it was going in. So is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is heaven's wind. Now, all throughout the book of Acts, you see even some people label it the Acts of the Apostles. That's a lie. It wasn't the Acts of the Apostles. It was the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, operating through the Apostles and operating through other people who were not the Apostles... But you see things move. You saw healing. You saw buildings shake. Um, you saw whole, whole just places like be changed by the wind. Uh, my parents um, took a, a job in Cheyenne, Wyoming years ago to pastor a church. And I remember going up to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and like it's a, a plateau, and so it's just flat. You'd have the wind whip across there so strong, no tree could stand in its way because this mighty wind would just push over everything. In fact, while I was there, true story, the wind pushed over a train. 
<laughs> like you, you couldn't see the wind, but you saw the mighty effects of the wind. And so it is with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the power of God. It is the, the, the quality of God that moves even physical things in our lives. Uh, we see this in the ministry of Jesus, in Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, you see that he did no mighty works until the power of God's Spirit rested upon him. Um, we see this in the book of Luke. They'll put it up on the screens. Uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee, notice, in the power of the Spirit. Uh, so it wasn't just Jesus having power. The power was coming from the Spirit of God. And news was about him spreading through all the surrounding districts. Now notice this in the, the next scripture, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Jesus said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. That word anointed just simply means, the, like we talked about, being a possessor of oil and wine. It means to pour oil out for the purpose of empowerment. Uh, so like for the Old Testament kings, they would be anointed with oil. Before the priest uh, ever served in the priesthood, they would be anointed with oil. Why? Uh, because it was a, a type and shadow of the Spirit of God, not just coming upon them, but coming upon them to empower them. So whenever you see the Spirit, you see power because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty uh, to, to, and the release of the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who have been oppressed. Now notice uh, that Jesus, for the rest of his ministry, went about doing that. You see blind eyes open. Uh, you see water turned into wine. You see five loaves and two fish feed a whole multitude. Uh, you see the dead raised. You see like mighty things moving in the earth. And he says, you know what that is? That's the spirit of God. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of it. You can't see the wind, but if you get still enough, you can sense the direction of it. Uh, and this is what the Holy Spirit is designed to do in Jesus' ministry, but not just in Jesus' ministry, in our own as well. Look at this in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with what? Power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, I love this verse for a number of reasons. Is notice every person who Jesus healed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, notice when he healed them, they were oppressed, not with a loving father trying to teach them a lesson through sickness and disease. They were oppressed by the devil. Uh, so every person Jesus healed, it was because the, the enemy had gained some type of stronghold in their life, but the anointing destroyed the yoke that was on them, and they began to be free. Uh, when Jesus was performing healings, he was not undoing the Father's will, he was performing the Father's will. Sickness is never the Father's will for any of his children. Jesus came to set the captives free, and notice the way that he brought healing, the way he brought deliverance, it was by the Spirit of God. Now, watch what Jesus said to us about the Spirit. So that's great for Jesus, but watch what he said about the Spirit of God for us in John chapter 14. Uh, we'll, we'll go to John 14, then we'll come back to Acts 1.8. John chapter 14. On the screens. Back up just a little. Okay, we'll roll with Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. There we go. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, here we're going to read this in the Amplified, and I like the Amplified Bible for this reason, is the Amplified will take the, the Hebrew and the Greek, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament was written in Greek, and they will give you a lot of the definitions for key words. And so the Amplified is not trying to be wordy, it's just giving you more definitions uh, for the same word. Uh, and so notice, uh, he says, Jesus does, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper. And notice what this helper will do. He will be a comforter. He will be an advocate. He will be an intercessor. He will be a counselor. He will be a strengthener. And he will be a standby to be with who? With you and me. That the same Holy Spirit that was on Jesus 
is the same Holy Spirit that he's pouring out on us. That the same Holy Spirit that was moving in the life of Jesus is the same Holy Spirit who wants to be with you forever. Well, what will he do? He will comfort you. He will be an advocate. This means to speak on your behalf. He will be an intercessor, prayer for you. He will be a counselor to you, a strengthener to you. And I love this. He says, you know what he is? He is standing by. Meaning anytime you need that help, you've got to know he's on standby, just ready for you to yield to him. But he's there ready to pour out oil and wine if you will acknowledge him. Now, when you were to break this up into three categories, and I'd love to preach on all three, but today I'm only going to teach on one, uh, and then tonight I'm going to teach on the other, and then next weekend I'll probably finish with this. Uh, but three things I see from this is, number one, he's going to help you with prayer. Uh, he's going to intercede, and he's going to be your advocate. An advocate would be like a lawyer, someone who speaks on your behalf. Uh, so he says he's going to help you with prayer. He's going to speak on your behalf. Number two, he's going to help you with power. Is there's going to be some things that in the natural, they're overwhelming you and others. And the Holy Spirit is going to help you because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. That there would be a power in us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead would also quicken and make alive our mortal bodies. Uh, and so he will be power to us, but he will also bring guidance. We'll talk about this one tonight. I'm going to talk about this one today, power. Notice in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you're in Acts chapter 2, just go over uh, to the, the chapter before this. Acts 1 and verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and into Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. But notice what happens when I receive the Holy Spirit. When I receive the Holy Spirit, I receive power. You did not get a different Holy Spirit than Jesus got. You did not get a different Holy Spirit than Stephen got. You did not get a different Holy Spirit than Paul got. You did not get a different Holy Spirit than John got. The same Holy Spirit that was on Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that is on the body of Christ. It is the same Spirit. And the reason why this is so important is because the Holy Spirit is designed to give Jesus and his body power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, notice what this power is there to do. It's to help you be a witness. I'll go back. It's to help you be a witness in all the earth. Now, a witness cannot testify about something that they've seen or heard secondhand. If you go to court and you call a witness... You want to bring somebody up on the stand who's like, no, I saw it. It, it. I didn't just hear about it from somebody else. I saw it firsthand. They did it. That's the person. Uh, I didn't just hear it from someone else. I heard it from them. With my own eyes and with my own ears, I had a very real experience that showed me this is the case in this case. And what he's talking about here is that our faith and the reason why the world should believe that we are Christians is that we are testifying not just about a Jesus that we have heard of, but we are testifying about a Jesus that we have tasted and we have seen that he is good. That our faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, our cute teachings, our favorite television preacher. That our faith does not stand in just what they say. Our faith stands and we have seen Jesus move. We have seen the power of God. We have seen God do what only God can do. And he says, do you know how you are going to be able to bear witness? It is through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and what we need, I'm telling you, we're losing a world. And cool church is not good enough anymore. Um, it, it's not going, cool preachers, it's not going to just cut it anymore. We are, our world is crying out for something that absolutely meets the needs of the world because just theology is not working for people. 
We cannot present logic with logic. Uh, we don't debate as the world debates. Knowledge puffs up. Uh, but what we have to see is that when we come back with the true and living God, a God who answers by fire, that power will destroy that logic. And the only way to walk in the power of God is to yield to the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Bible is so great because a lot of us will wonder, well, what in, what in the world does that look like? When, when the Holy Spirit is giving me power, what does that power look like? Notice what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, they'll put this up on the screens in verse number 7. But to each one, everyone say each one. Let me hear you, Highland Colony. Each one. Each one. Now, what does each one mean? Every person. Every person who, in the body of Christ. That the same spirit that was on Jesus in his physical body is the same spirit that is now on the body of Christ. And so to each one in that body is given the manifestation of the spirit. Now, what is the manifestation of the spirit? You can't see the wind, but you see the effects of it. You see the, the leaves move. You see the train tip over. You see the effects of it. And when the Holy Spirit is moving, it says here's how he's going to work. He's going to move for the common good, for the advancement of the kingdom. And, and watch how he says he moves here in verse number 7. But to eat, or verse number 8. Uh, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Now notice the Spirit is demonstrating his power through each one of us, and it comes in different ways. But he says one of the ways in which God's Spirit will work is he will begin to speak through you to others. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Uh, somebody says, well, what in the world is the difference between a, world, a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge? The word of wisdom sees and says something about the future. The word of knowledge sees something in the present or the past. Um, now, with all these things, uh, what you'll see is that they're gifts of the Spirit. And a gift is not something like you force. If you came and you're like, give me your wallet. I'm like, I can't give it to you. You can take it uh, right now. But with this attitude, it's not a gift. Uh, so we can't come to God and be like, a word now. <laughs> so like this kind of thing. Uh, what I can do, though, is I can yield to what you're giving. And I can live in a position when you want to give the gift, I'm ready to receive it. Um, and this is our job as believers, is to, to yield to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit, to not grieve him, to not quench him, but to yield to him because he's got things that he wants to do for you, but also through you to others. I saw a couple of years ago, I was in Tulsa, um, and um, I'm on a, a board, kind of a missions board, and um, I was going up there for a board meeting, and I had about two or three hours in my hotel before I had to be at the meeting. Now, for those of you who are parents, especially of young children, you understand when you have two or three hours alone, you've got a little taste of heaven on earth. Like there, there's just, especially if you're an introvert, like just a space to kind of relax and clear your mind. Um, and so like I took up a moment to just pray and to, to yield to the Lord, to, to, to get filled with God's spirit. Because I told the Lord, like when I go into this meeting, I, I, I only sit in one of these things like one to two times a year but I want to sit in there with what you want to say and not just what I feel like needs to be said. And so fill me up with oil and wine so I can pour it out if I need to. And I'm just sitting there yielding to the Lord. Uh, and so I, I just sense God's presence. It was a real, you know, kind of sweet moment. Uh, but nothing kind of came. Uh, no direction kind of came, but I knew I was yielded, and that was enough, because the, the, the true gift is his presence, that I may know him. I want to know him. I want to walk with him. Like Enoch, I want to walk with God. 
Um, and so out of that, like, I just yielded to him. Uh, and I, I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, okay, I need to go. But before I go, I need to get some coffee. Uh, because it had been a long day, and I thought a shot of espresso would hurt nobody right now. Um, and uh, so I, I pull up, you know, coffee shops in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is where I was, and I, I see this, this one that has, like, all these reviews, and I'm like, that's the one. That's where I'm going. Uh, you know, everyone's like, best coffee in Tulsa, you know, that kind of thing. But, like I talked about, the Holy Spirit is also a, a wind, in that if you are aware of him, you can sense his direction. And like the more I'm trying to go in that direction, I was going crosswind with the Holy Spirit. It's like, I'm not supposed to go to that coffee shop. And somebody said, was it a voice? No, it was just a sensing. You can't see the wind, but you can sense it. And I knew like, I'm not supposed to go to that coffee shop. And I, I keep looking, I'm like, I think I'm supposed to go to that coffee shop. And they didn't have all the reviews. I'm like, can we please change this, Lord? Uh, like, anyway. Uh, but I just obeyed. And I went to this coffee shop. And as soon as I walk into this coffee shop, I know, I know it is filled with Christians. And somebody says, how do you know that? Because Jesus is the light of the world. Now, for those of us uh, who are living in this day and age, we see all the lights. And we don't fully get the, the analogy. In those days, the only light they had was light by fire, the sun, um, a flame, a torch, a lamp uh, that had fire to it. So whenever you think fire, it's not just light, it's warmth. And with fire, you get away from fire, you can sense it. You get closer to fire, you can sense it. Uh, and when you become alert spiritually, filled with God's spirit, aware of God's spirit, you can sense fire. Um, and, and out of that, like, I'm like, there's a lot of light here, like just in my heart. And I look over in the corner, and I see this guy sitting there uh, at a table with some other people. And as soon as I see him, the Lord gives me a word for him. And it just came. It was a gift. I wasn't trying to make it happen. It wasn't like, God, you know, like this prayer moment of like, God, help me speak something. It just came. It's a gift. It's a manifestation of the Spirit. God's wind wants to blow. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at this, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, he's with people right now. I'll wait for him to get away. So I kind of, you know, took a back seat in the coffee shop and just kind of watching him. And I'm like, God, you know, like, I need him to get up from the table. It's amazing all these, all these games we play with God sometimes. But it's like, get him away from the table. Like, I don't want to make it awkward. And really, it's not that I wanted to make it awkward. I didn't want to make it awkward for me. Like, I, I, I didn't want to have this moment where it's, like, weird for me. Uh, and so sure enough, he gets up from the table. I'm like, okay, maybe now. And then he's walking out and I'm like, oh, I can't do it. I, so I'm like, I'm like, I just, I, I said, Lord, help make me bolder, please. And so he, he walks out towards his car and I'm like, father, if this is you, give me another chance. Like help him come back in. I see him. I'm watching him out of the window and he's digging through his car and, you know, he's about to get in, but right before he gets in the driver's seat, he stops, he shuts the door, and he walks back towards the coffee shop. And I see him walk in, and he goes to the restroom, and I'm like, well, I'm not doing it in there. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. And so finally, he, he walks out, and he's walking back out to the car, and I'm like, now or never. So I walk out into the parking lot kind of behind him. I'm like, sir. And he turned around, and I said, I'm a Christian. I said, I, I can tell you are too. I said, I just kind of sense it. I said, I, I don't want to be weird, uh, but I said, I believe I have a word for you. And if you want it, I'll give it to you. If not, that's okay. Why? Because it's a gift. You, you don't lay hands on anybody suddenly. You see where they're at. See, Ezekiel had a prophecy of a river and for some, it was to the ankles, and for some, it was to the, the knees, and for others, it was to the waist. For others, they're swimming in it. And you got a lot of people in Christianity, they're just to the ankles, and they're okay with it. They're in the river. They're born again. They're in the river, but they are set in their ways. And God is like, you could walk out a little bit deeper. 
And if you walked out a little bit deeper, you would find the river take you where you could never take yourself if you just get in the river all the way. Uh, and so out of that, like I wanted to see, is he willing to kind of advance in the river? If he is, let's go. And he said, speak on. And I said, the Lord sees you, and he sees you like a David. And you've watched every other person stand before you, and people tried to anoint them king. And you've been watching each person be anointed. But now the Lord says, it's time for you to come out of the shadows, and it's time for you to stand in the office that God has called you to stand in, because it's not just an office for a pastorate in this city but it's an office that God will use to go from this city to other nations of the world. I said some other things that the Lord showed me, not just about his future, but about his past. It was a combination of word of wisdom and word of knowledge. And the whole time I'm speaking, he's bawling like a baby. And finally, the Lord was done, and then he looked up at me, and he said, who are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm a Christian from Mississippi. Uh, and uh, he said, it's, it's so nice to meet you. He said, I can't tell you what this means. He said, this week, um, the board of the church that I've worked for for years came to me and said, we want you to be the pastor. He said, for years, I knew I was supposed to be, but every other person would kind of come in. And I always felt like my gifts and my talents were ignored and, and kind of not seen, that I was always kind of like David, kind of left out with man, not seeing who I felt like God had called me to be. And he said, this week, um, they, they installed me as pastor, and uh, I've been questioning the whole week if I could do it, and some people were upset that they installed me, so they left the church, and I came here tonight, and I told God I'd need a word. Oh, come on, somebody. What if I told you this type of Christianity is available to you? That you could be a person who is filled with God's oil and wine. That you could be a carrier of the anointing of God. That you could see that this oil and wine would not just heal and cleanse your wounds, but it, if you carried it, it could be a healer of the wounds of others. That your children were not just made to come to church, but God was made so real in the house, they couldn't help but to come to church. Uh, that out of this, oh, God is leading us and, and, and performing his will through us. I went to Syria, or right on the edge of Syria, with my wife to a Syrian refugee camp on the border of Lebanon. And we're there at all these Syrian refugee camps. And we walk into this one lady's kind of hut that the United Nations had built. And we're going in there to like pray for people. And she had brought everybody, like everyone in the town. And we're like, what is going on? Like, this is pretty amazing. Because when you go into other nations, like Buddhist nations, you know, nations where, where Islam is everywhere, you better come in with a God who answers by fire. Because if not, you're comparing logic to logic. Um, and so out of that, it's like, okay, God, anoint us with your spirit as we go into these places. We need to show a living and true God. And so we're, we're out there, and we walk in, and it's like, we walk in, and like, sh this lady, this little lady is bringing all these people in. We're like, why? And she's like, a team from your church came here six months ago. And she said, while they were here, she's saying all this through an interpreter, while they were here, they told us about Jesus. And how that Jesus was a healer. If there was anybody in the house that needed healing, they could be healed in the name of Jesus. And her, hu her husband and her daughter were both healed on that day. From that day forward, they were, became believers of Jesus and had been waiting for people to come back so that they could bring the whole community together. <laughs> what is that? You, you will be anointed. With the Holy Spirit and with power, you could have a spirit of seeing and knowing. You could deal with things in the spirit with your kids before they ever even happen because the Lord showed you something to do and to say or to take an action on. Like we have at our disposal oil and wine anytime we want to yield to it. Any, it's literally standing by right here waiting for us to turn to it. You will receive power. And that's, that's genuinely what I want for you and for your children. 
and for this church. I, I want a church that's filled with God's Holy Spirit. A church that is filled with each one of us having a word and a song and a, a spiritual song and each one of us being carriers of this oil and wine so that not only we could walk in healing, but we could be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community until everyone in the Jackson metro area had seen the goodness of God in the land of the living. Because we have people who know they are carriers of more than just something natural. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you today and we'll end in song. Father, we come before you. We love you. We honor you. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just thank you that you fill us afresh and anew at all of our campuses. Father, if there's anyone today at any campus who needs to come to you, if there's anyone today at any campus who wants to be filled with your spirit, Father, I thank you that you meet them in a very real and personal way. Father, we love you, we honor you, and we give you thanks and praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.